This is the third video in the series, Your Family Tree. The first video was getting started. The second video was research. And the third video is Your Family Tree Citing Sources. The release of this video has been slow due to the problems of purchasing a new desktop computer which I needed to produce videos. This has been a bad experience for me due to the fact that what they advertised and what I received was totally different. I finally found what I was looking for, which was quality at a great price. Now back to your family tree citing your sources. This video has been difficult since there are so many opinions on how to cite your sources. In this video, I'm using Roots Magic Templates to help you cite your sources. Our goal is to help you get started with citing your sources. For a genealogy software, each program has their own goals. These goals are to collect information that is easy for users to enter, to support evidence analysis, and comparison to create proof arguments. These proof arguments support genealogical conclusions in the database. Most of the major commercial genealogy programs use their own relational schema, in other words, plans for storage of citation data. Our agenda in this video includes citation basics, citation templates, and examples which I'll provide. Evidence, analysis, and proof. How to prove what you found. Evidence Explained is the definitive guide to the citation and analysis of historical sources with over 1,000 citation examples. Evidence Explained guides you through a maze of sources not covered by other citation manuals. Every devoted genealogist is concerned with citations in their analysis for the genealogy. Accurate citations are necessary so that the evidence can be judged and, if necessary, allows for the research to be repeated. Elizabeth Schoen Mills makes it easy to help genealogists make sense out of citations and to improve their genealogy research. At the end of this video, I will provide a link to Evidence Explained with sample text messages, which you will find most beneficial. And there's Elizabeth Schoen Mills' second book, Evidence Citation and Analysis for the Family Historian. Evidence Explained. Citing History Sources from Artifacts to Cyberspace by Elizabeth Schoen Mills. Now, if you have this book in your library or you can get a copy, read pages 39 to 90. That's Citation Basics or Fundamentals of Citations. You'll find this most beneficial. You can use the index to find the country you're searching. You can get help on if you're searching in Canada, England, Ireland, or any other country. Check the index. It'll, it'll show you how to use the records of various countries and how to cite your sources. Let us talk about using genealogy software for documenting our family history and genealogical records. I'm going to talk about Roots Magic 7 and Legacy 9. Roots Magic 7 has a source manager and a citation manager. We'll discuss these and show actual examples from my own genealogy. Legacy 9 as a source writer that's not available in the standard version, you must purchase the deluxe version in order to get the source writer. The source writer will help you cite your sources. Software programs will help you enter the information correctly 
and precisely formatted to match the genealogy industry standards for source citations when printing footnotes, endnotes, and bibliographies. Multiple citations for an event can be combined into one paragraph, thus avoiding a long string of superscripted numbers within the book or report body. Roots Magic 7 and Legacy 9 has webinars you can watch to help you with your sources and citations. This is an excellent resource. I will leave these links at the bottom of this video. This is a brief story of my ancestors' immigration from England to Canada. I will provide source and citation examples from my own genealogy. Miles Campbell's occupation was an agricultural laborer. There were no opportunities for a better life. This type of occupation required one to look for work wherever they could. During those years, an agricultural laborer was believed to be paid 12 to 15 shillings per week. Working long hours and the rates of pay were low. Not much for a family of four to live on during these years. Miles and family decided to leave England and travel to Canada. They arrived at the Pocklington Railway Station to begin their journey to the Waterloo docks in Liverpool. When I located my English relatives, I had the opportunity to visit them. Being a tourist and genealogist, I visited bookstores and museums while in England and Scotland. I came across this book, which was a great find for my research work. Miles Campbell and family traveled by train across the northeastern corner of Yorkshire, England, to the west port of Liverpool. This book provided possible routes and the length of their journey. This is an example of a basic book template. I will discuss this template in detail. How do you use templates in Roots Magic? Well, we'll talk about that. How do you use the Roots Magic templates? Within the database, you're going to select the individual that you want to add the source and citation to. And under Personal Details, select Sources. When you clicked on Sources, the Citation Manager menu will be displayed. The Citation Manager provides a list of sources associated with a person. This displays the select source type of menu. The sources are listed alphabetically. To cite the British Railways book, I would select Book Basic Format Template. This opens the Citations Manager. Let's take a look at this. Now, after I selected Book basic format citation the following menu opens now remember the source templates in roots magic are designed from models published in style guides by elizabeth Sean mills and richard s lackey to complete the template you'll need the following information from the book you'll need the name of the book the author title, subtitle, published place, publisher, and published date, and my source details are page 20 to 22, which lists the train and routes that Miles and family had to take. Now notice this template provides the footnote, short note, and bibliography after you completed the template. After traveling across England,
from the east to the west coast, Miles and family arrived at the Waterloo docks in Liverpool, England. Most immigrant families could only afford a steerage passage, which was the cheapest rate. Miles would make the best bargain he could with the passage brokers and pay the passage money. The fares varied from day to day, even hour to hour, being as high as five pounds per passenger in a steerage, and sometimes as low as three pounds ten shillings. After Miles had chosen the ship by which he and his family would sail, his next duty is to present himself at the medical inspector's office. By terms of the new Passage Act, no passenger ship is allowed to proceed until the medical pa practitioner, appointed by the immigration office of the port, shall have inspected the medicine chest and passengers and certified that the medicine, etc., are sufficient and that the passengers are free from contagious diseases. When Miles and his family have undergone this process, their passage ticket is stamped, and they have nothing further to do until they go aboard, but to make their own private arrangements and provide themselves with articles of necessity as they may desire over and above the ship allowance. The scene at the Waterloo Dock at Liverpool is busy on the morning of departure. Miles and his family may have taken quarters on board prior to departure. They are entitled to bring boxes and trunks containing their worldly wealth and considerable quantities of provisions. The following is the scale in addition to any provisions which they may bring themselves. Two and a half pound of bread or biscuits. One pound of wheat and flour. Five pounds of oatmeal. Two pounds of rice. Two ounces of tea. A half a pound of sugar. A half a pound of molasses, three quarts of water daily. Vessels carrying as many as 100 passengers must be provided with a seafaring person to act as a passenger's cook with proper cooking apparatus. The convenient place must be set apart on deck for cooking. At the end of the departure, there is usually many spectators at the dock gates to witness the final departure of the ship. Miles had family members who wished them a pleasant and safe voyage from the docks at departure. The last look must have been sorrowful for the families that left the dock for the new world. The ship is generally towed by a steam tug five or ten miles down the river and during the time occupied, two important ceremonies have taken place. The first is the search for stowaways, and the second is the roll call of passengers. The roll call takes considerable time, especially if the ship is large. The clerk or man in authority would call out the names of the passengers. Miles and his family would have to answer this call and be subject again to medical inspection by the captain and owners of the ship. On some ships, the conditions aboard were very poor. The Journey to America In the early 19th century, sailing ships took about six weeks to cross the Atlantic. With adverse winds or bad weather, the journey could take as long as 14 weeks. When this happened, the passengers would often run short of provisions. Unfortunately, I could not find the ship my ancestors came from England on, and I'm not sure where they landed at, possibly Quebec. However, I have English and Canada census records, which puts their arrival in Canada within 12 months of their arrival. Now, I've just given you a fairly lengthy description of leaving England and coming to Canada. 
from what I just described in the previous slide was taken from the Illustrated London News on July 6, 1850, Volume 17, pages 20 to 22. This is a newspaper story about the tide of immigration to the United States and to the British colonies and what it was like to leave the homeland, whether that be England or Ireland. Your family tree is more than the names and dates of your ancestors. It should be about why they left their country of origin and the life they lived after they reached their destination. The following is a newspaper citation example from a newspaper. The previous slide was an example of a newspaper citation. Let's take a look at census records, England and Canada, and specifically 1851. On the left is England 1851 census, on the right is Canada 1851 census. I would list both of these census records in the repository menu, and we'll talk about that later where I found each census record. The 1851 census was taken 31 March 1851 prior to Miles leaving England. The Canada 1851 census was not actually taken until January 1852. Check the date of your census records to be sure when the census was taken. Here's a prime example. Commissioners for each county and city had received their appointments by November and December 1851. These commissioners would then appoint individual enumerators to cover a specific area. The actual enumeration in the 1851 Canada Census was January 1852. Each census record provides probable dates, miles, and family, and their arrival in Canada. Based on this information, this helps me to do a timeline on the family. From the census records, you have the information needed to complete each citation. Let us take a look at these citations. I would locate the two census templates in Roots Magic, one for England, 1851, and one for Canada, 1851. As you can see from the census templates, I used the census record from the previous slide to complete the citation. The repository information is recorded in Roots Magic. I have a couple of slides to show the repository information and the menu. Okay, let's talk about land records and the citation that's involved. Continuing with my story about Miles, he applied for a land patent in 1874 and eventually was approved for 160 acres in Bruce County, Ontario. So he moved his family from a populated place with established farms to what was known as the wilderness and started to build his own farm. The following is the land records template from the index of land patents from the archives of Ontario. I filled out the land record template from these records which I received on microfilm from the archives of Ontario. Roots Magic will create a list of repositories for you. As you add your sources from the sources menu and the to do items in Roots Magic, your repository will be automatically created for you. In the Repositories list menu, you have various options. You can click the Add button to add a repository. You can click on Send Mail or Visit Website buttons to confirm that you've entered the information correctly. 
You can also view your list of the various repositories that you've used. Print sources and citations from the source list menu. You've got several options to choose from. Depending upon the report or the book you wish to publish, you have the choice of how you want your citations to appear. Footnotes at the bottom of each page or at the end of the document or book. Endnotes at the end of the document as well as a bibliography. So you've got a few options there on how you want your sources and citations to appear in each report or book that you're going to print. Our last two slides deal with evidence analysis. You want to examine your sources closely. You want the original form of the source, the original document. Other words, the source in its first oral or recorded form. A derivative form can carry the same weight as an original. For example, a duplicate original copy made at the same time as the actual original. An image copy like a digital film or photo image typically treated as an original so long as no evidence suggests that the image might have been altered. Official record copy, a clerk's copy usually entered into a register, typically treated as an original when the original does not exist or access to it is denied. Information. Each piece of information within a source must be appraised separately because any source can offer first-hand or second-hand information. From my own experience, I may take a second or third look and may have missed something. So it's very important to examine this information. Statements of data offered by a source can be primary. Details provided someone with first-hand knowledge of the fact recorded. Secondary. Details provided by someone with second-hand or more distant knowledge. The last is evidence. Evidence that is relevant to the problem. Evidence is usually one of two types. Direct evidence. The source answers the research question by itself, solves the problem. Indirect. This source is relevant that cannot alone answer the question but needs additional information. So what happens when you put all three together? Source plus information plus evidence. Together you get you get proof. After careful analysis and evaluation of the associated source, backed by thorough research and documentation, results in proof. You proved your source. Quality does not rest upon any simple statement of fact. Proof should rest upon the total, the total of all evidence. So source plus information plus evidence equals proof. Once you have that proof, you're satisfied with it, then you can go ahead and cite your source. Coming soon, how to get started with FamilySearch.org. Please visit us again and tune in, and we'll show you how to use FamilySearch.org, how to get started. Thanks for your time, and I wish you the best in your research work. Put your questions and comments below, 
and give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you again. Bye.